just been through a period, haven't we, with, uh, with Mosley as the head of the FIA, and, and we all know that Mosley's background is, is, is a legal one, and um, he's had a heck of an impact on the design of cars because under his leadership, the FIA rules have become more and more and more prescriptive. They're actually to the point now where they dimension the shape of, uh, of, of the actual driver entry area, uh, the overall cockpit size. Uh, there are so many dimensions now when you're actually designing a Formula One car. It's, it struck me that you first of all lay out all of these rules before you could do anything mm -hmm. to see where you'd actually have room. But I wonder, is there a possibility that you could you know, go back and, and resolve these rules in a different way so that you might actually foster more innovation? Because at the moment, it's almost a kind of an engineer fighting a lawyer. Isn't there another way we could do this? Um, well, I don't know. I think uh, certainly, um, I suppose the, the, the rule book is, and I suppose if you actually haven't seen the, the cars down there, if you actually look uh, at the 2000 and, was it 2004, Ferrari and the 2006 uh, McLaren, there's actually a lot of uh, similarities there. You, know, you look at the car and even over two years, they're actually, they're actually a very, very similar looking car. And, and really that's what the rule book has mm. done, um, mm. is that it's a, it's a prescription, um, you know, and, and, it, and, and I suppose the, the longer time goes on, the, the, the more prescript it gets, and, mm. and then that limits the opportunities for innovation it just mean you know, and it just shows also the scale up of the of the of the teams. Uh, when I, or you know, um, sorry, 40, 50, 50 years ago, you know, the teams would have a, have one tran a couple of transporters, a couple of cars, and the mechanics that were going around probably were the ones that built the cars and, and half by designed the cars. Whereas now, you know, the an F1 organisation or at Tyrrell when I was there. Um, was around uh, 200, 250 employees, whereas if you look at a, a McLaren now, Bob, how many employees would McLaren have now? Oh, it's probably 650, mm. I yeah. would say something like that. It's, so and, it's and, and what's happened is that the, um, just the sheer scale of the teams uh, means that a lot of the, the rules are being tested, well not the rules are being tested, the cars are being developed 24-7 um, really, uh, and but there isn't a lot of trying to eke out that innovation, but the actual leaps in innovation are, are very, um, yeah, are, are very hard to achieve. Yeah, we've got very a intense. question at the back there, but just before um, we get to you, just to illustrate your point a little more, um, there used to be two truckies for, for each truck. A McLaren, there used to be four trucks that went to each Grand Prix. So down to Monaco and back, you'd take eight truckies, effectively. They washed the thing, they'd drive it, Tire fitters during the weekend, tire people, all garage organisers, the whole thing. When the EU driving regulations came in, you couldn't drive any more than four hours at a time with an hour rest and all that sort of stuff. You couldn't work the, work the weekend. So for four trucks now to go to Monaco, 18 truck drivers are involved and there are an extra four on standby. So suddenly you've got 22 truck drivers instead of eight. So that's another regulation. Anyway, we had a question at the back there. I was going to ask about the relationship between the FIA designers and the team's designers, how much, how much uh, tension is there, and I was also going to ask about Max Mosley, and then you just introduced that. Does he <laughs> rule the FIA designers? Do they have any independent say? Well, well, what I mean by FIA designers is the, um, the people that set the rules. Mm -hmm. I think... I think I'll start off by, my mother always used to say, don't talk about anybody unless you can talk nicely about them, so I'll refuse the max bit for a start. Um, I, the FIA don't have designers necessarily. They have people who come up with rules to try and counteract what is happening effectively. They, they rarely innovate, they react. Um, but, but David was closer to that than me, so you take that on. Uh, well, yeah, from my, well, we weren't, I never really had any direct involvement with the, with the FIA. Um, uh, the, uh, from my experience, they didn't, they, they're not designers per se. They're, yeah, just literally they're the rule makers and it's, and it's rules that are made specifically to, for a situation such as safety. Um, you know, and, and, and those rules, you know, there's, there's obviously a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the constructors don't actually um, don't actually fight a lot of the rules. A lot of the rules are very sensible in terms of um, you know safety, 
And, um, and I know while I was there, there was some huge moves in terms of safety that added a huge amount of cost you know, to, a, to Tyrrell. Um, our budgets were nothing like the, the McLarens and the Ferraris. Um, and you know, to actually put your car forward for a lot of testing, which is destructive testing, uh, to ensure that your car would pass the tests in order to front up to the grid. Um, was you know a huge amount of cost, but at the end of the day, it was, it was some of those rules were safety driven, um, and you know there wasn't tension there really between the teams and, and the FIA in any stretch of the imagination. It would be fair to say that the interaction with the FIA is primarily an upper level management thing. Mm. Most engineers are actually pretty pragmatic, and if you told them they all had to paint their car pink, they just go, oh, "It's a pink car, but how can we get around that? What what sort of pink are we talking?" You know. How heavy was the pink? Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps we should move on then from the rule book, unless there are any other questions. Or, yep. Come on, Janelle, for God's sakes. This is Formula One, isn't it? <laughs> One of the main things this year has been the rear diffuser debacle. How could Ferrari, Renault and McLaren get it all wrong and Ross Braun get it right? And my second part of the question is, how much of an influence do you think of this new diffuser has limited the overtaking which the new rules were actually introduced to do? Okay, did, did everybody hear that question? Was there a reasonable understanding of what the question was? Okay, guys. I think the second part of your question, how much has it affected overtaking, is not that much, to be honest. Um, just the diffuser. I don't think that has affected the lack of overtaking. I think it's a whole car thing, not not just that. Um, did they get it wrong? No, they just didn't get it as right um, because the, the rules were there. The, in actual fact, McLaren and Ferrari approached the FIA with a slightly different system and said, you think this is legal? And Charlie said, no, that's not legal. So they didn't pursue it anymore. Plus the fact that Ferrari, McLaren, BMW and those people put all their efforts into winning the championship or whatever the year before and they neglected to get onto the 2010 car. Don't forget Braun car was Honda. Honda put more money into last, in, into last year for this year's car than any other team has ever done before with some of the best engineers ever. The mere fact that it happens to be called a Braun at the end of it and everybody says isn't it wonderful there's a new team on the grid is absolute crap. It is a Honda car with a Mercedes engine. So the car, the chassis itself, was developed with all that money. They hit on an idea that was slightly different to McLaren and Ferrari, and their idea was accepted as being right, which has been proved by the regulations. They just happened to get it right, and the other guys just took the eye off the ball, in my opinion, that's all. As yeah. soon as the other team saw it, you can guarantee they started developing it. But the problem oh. is, you can't just suddenly bolt it on the back no. of the car because you've got to worry about the front of the car. Adrian, and it's Adrian, a whole thing. Yeah, I think, I think one of the, the key things is, is that actually uh, Ross Braun is a very, very astute. He's probably one of the top designers um, that's probably ever been in Formula One. And, um, and he, his interpretation, he, he got it exactly bang on. You know, Adrian Newey, um, he, you know, uh, they actually, they didn't, 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 uh, they didn't get there, but uh, they've actually developed, they've been probably the fastest to, to redevelop the fact that they didn't have the diffuser, and um, and I think you know you, you, all of the teams are playing catch up, um, but yeah, I think yeah, Ross Braun was it's very astute. It's interesting where that idea came from. That came from Toyota. Toyota Formula One team developed it. The guys that developed it left. One went to Honda, that team as it was, and then became Braun. And one went to Red Bull. Three teams that have had the system. So, you know, generically, there is a lineage of where that idea came from. I don't know the guy himself, but they didn't independently think of that. There was, it came from one person who told another and went to another team and they developed it. And this is where the old story about how much IP do you take from one team to another. You know, McLaren got fined 100 million US dollars for doing it. Well, the mistake they made was using a, a photocopy. That was silly. Why did you know? <laughs> oh, my God. You know, I was, I was through Red Bull two years ago and... Uh, a friend of mine's a development engineer there, and he'd come and he said, oh, look at our new rack, it's cute as a button. He said, this is Renault's rack last year. He said, we've got their, their hydraulics guy. And two days later, I was in Renault having a look around, I've got a friend works there. And I said, oh, show me your rack, and sure enough. You know, so the knowledge is, there's no magic bullet. You know, it's very, media likes to play things back and white, or oh, magic diffuser, you know, new tyre. No, it's not, everything has to work together. And, and even an inferior package, if you get more bits right, will beat a brilliant idea. And that's, that's the risk within it. It's just not as visible as the good old days. You know, when you could bolt, you know, crank up a wing in the, out the back shed overnight and bolt it on and find half a second a lap. 
Just like that BRM in there. <laughs> <laughs> Built in a garden shed. It was, yeah.